We're wrapping up season 20 with DEF CON 24. All that and more this time on Hack 5. Hello, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. My name is Shannon Morse. It's your weekly dose of techno lust. And this is our second episode of all the things from DEF CON 24. And you know what else it is? It's the wrapping up the season. It is wrapping up season 20. Nice. Yes, that's what, 26 episodes? 26 episodes versus yeah. 11 First season. years, and the, we're still here. Yes, that does not make any sense Let's on the internet. Let's just go with it. It does. It just <laughs> does. TV show guy. Yes. Whatever. Hey, did you know our 11th, uh, our 11 year anniversary was our last binary number uh, for the next 100 years? Oh, Hack wow. Hack five turned three. Yes, it, it did. It only took 11 years. <laughs> You're ridiculous. I am. I am. But it's <laughs> so. the techno less. You got to go with it. I'm very excited about this show because yeah. we have both Dark Matter and Alan from Semaphore talking about some like privacy and really good security stuff. stuff that's like, oh my gosh, yeah. in my heart. Excellent, excellent talk. Uh, the, we have some great interviews, including Mark Newland as well, who's the guy behind Mousejack, nice. which is an, a really interesting vulnerability that he found in a ton of the Bluetooth alternative oh, mice right? that are I know on what you're the market. About. Or should I say mouses? Mouses? Mices? Mices, tweet us at Hack Five and let us electronic know. Electronic mouses, mices. I'm gonna mice. say mice. We're gonna go with mice. <laughs> and with that, we will see you on the other side. I'm back here with Dark Matter, who you may recall from a previous DefCon. This is DefCon 24. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm pretty awesome. So awesome. So last year you came here with this amazing device. Can you give us a slight little review, maybe? So last year, I wanted to come to DEF CON and do a little bit of war walking because, uh, you know, PCAP all the things and, you know, everyone says this is the most dangerous, most crazy network and I wanted to see actual truth behind it. Is there really stuff we need to be worried about here? You know, you never know unless you have the PCAPs. So I built this box. Uh, it's got a BeagleBone Black. We've got uh, alpha antennas in there. And I was just using it in my backpack, walking around for as many hours as I could. I can get about 10 hours out of the battery life before it crashes. And then, uh, yeah, I did that. And then I talked at a conference in Utah called SaintCon about the, the results. Of course, we saw pineapples. Of course. Uh, of course, we saw deauth attacks. Of course, we saw karma attacks. Of course, we saw people doing retarded stuff with Python scripts that just fill the airways of DDoS, of course. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so from there, uh, I did a talk at this conference called SateCon in Utah and uh, got in touch with some pretty awesome people uh, at the Minnowboard Foundation that were like, hey, we like this idea and let's make it bigger. So they were able to donate me a tons of stuff this year and we actually have 12 nodes deployed throughout the conference. <laughs> Seriously, dude? Okay, so you have to tell me, uh, first off, what the heck are you planning to do with these 12 nodes? So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that we can do. So the boards are made up of the Intel Minnow board, which is a freaking rock star board. It's got a quad-core atom in it, super fast, USB 3.0. Uh, yeah, and you can you can hook it up to so many different devices. It's it's amazing board. I've been very happy with it. I mean, they're, they sponsored me, so they're awesome. But also, I truly do love this board. Um, and then from there, we hooked up three Alpha or excuse me, uh, ATH. 9K radios uh, for monitoring, and then also I brought in an ADA211 uh, AC radio, the Alpha uh, AC1200. I couldn't find, it took me about a month to find drivers for it uh, that I could switch it to monitor mode. And in fact, the drivers themselves wouldn't do it. I ended up having to patch some beta drivers produced by Raylink. It's a Raylink 8812 chip. Uh, had to patch it myself to be able to get it to stay in monitoring mode, into monitoring mode without crashing. And as far as I know, I, I mean, I, I think I'm one of the first. I mean, this, if somebody's out there that wants to call first, but I'm calling first and this is my forum, so. First, uh, yeah. So you stuck everything into a couple of different cases, right? And yep. are you are you sitting these in different places, or are you literally like walking around with them? Yeah, luckily, uh, originally I have a battery in the unit, and I was gonna just do a dead drops because I didn't know if I was gonna get access or not, and so I was gonna see. And th with the battery I have in there and my prototype is about ten hours. And so um, then I wanted to try to see if I can get support from DEF CON because then maybe I could get real-time statistics, maybe I could get some real-time data, you know, see what I could do, reach out to them. Didn't expect much. I was going to plan to do it without them. They were fully on board. They, they're like, we want to support this, yes. So they sent a team of goons with me on Thursday uh, to come and uh, uh, help me deploy nodes. We spent about nine hours it took to deploy 12 nodes throughout the conference. Uh, and I am literally overlapping 
happening in every location in the conference. So uh, some of the results of this is going to be the GP, uh, the uh, sorry, the PCAP data. Uh, you know, seeing the different attacks and stuff. And so we've heard about some pretty interesting stuff already popping off. So hopefully, I'll have proof of these things. But in addition to that, there's also the human tracking element of it. So if we can take device MAC addresses and turn them into human beings, I can correlate position and probably triangulate people walking through the conference. So that's a subset of the things that I'm working on for this. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a freaking awesome year. It's been super exciting. Uh, we've been pulling it off. The nodes are all deployed. Data is being captured. Yesterday when I checked my nodes in the NOC, they were already at four gigs of data. So yeah, it's, this is going to be crazy. So. Okay, so I can fully understand why tracking human beings around the convention center would be extremely useful for future conventions and making, you know, making DEF CON harder, better, faster, and stronger. Uh, can I just ask you a question real quick? Who are these people that are leaving their wireless on? I know, right? And and the, see, the thing is, is everyone's running around saying we turn everything off, turn, but then people are like, ah, oh, no, there's nothing really, there's no real threat. But it's like, okay, well, guess what? Really? I'm going to have the PCAPs. So it's going to be like, guess what? PCAPs or it didn't happen. Well, I'm going to have the PCAPs. And so I'm going to be like, listen, we can defend ourselves. We can increase our privacy by having visibility into this data. We've never had this as far as I know. I talk to people. Nobody's collected the data at this level. So that was one of the biggest things I wanted to do is give back to the community and say, how can we do this to improve our privacy? So. I got two more questions for you. First off, have you found any very, very pertinent and interesting information so far at this convention? Uh, I haven't had time to even start diving into the PCAPs. So other than going through some Kismet alert logs, I've seen tons of deauth attacks. I've seen some pineapples and karma attacks. And so, I mean, that's going to be standard. Uh, but uh, there's so much analysis to be done. I think it's awesome that you're doing this. I, I feel like this is like volunteering work for DEF CON. It's very, very cool and awesome that you're being supported by Intel as well. Uh, where can people find more information and are you going to post uh, these details online for the wider community base to hear about it? Absolutely. So this project here specifically from last year, I have a full write-up on my website. It's palshack.org or palshack.org if you're a fed. Uh, uh, and. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Dark Matter on Twitter, but instead of A's, I use fours. So, of course. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to do a full write-up on everything that's going on this year. Uh, I, I need to talk to uh, maybe EFF about the PCAPs and see if we can release those. I'd love to release those to the, the public, just like they release like the CTF stuff. I think that would be rad to put it on the DEF CON hard drive. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see. To be determined, of course. And, um, yeah, I'm just super excited about this project and put it out there and be involved so sweet thank you so much dark matter it was much appreciated that you would join us again for this year i'm off to drink all the booze and hack all the things hack all the things <laughs>
hardware, service or encoding Connected to the internet and someone's gonna own it This is for the pirates that clap and love the sound Attacking from the cloud, then we're back in underground There's no masking from us now We pop tour nodes around the globe, track and hunt you down Packed on schedule, added to your calendar Devices online, here comes another challenger State infiltrated, so undercover This is for my comrades who stare at the debuggers And trace every buffer, examining the code flow Haven't been to sleep, better pop another no dose I think I'll need a planet-sized urn Cause some men just wanna watch the world burn Your turn We stay out of jail Technologically possible, yeah. Drink all the booze, hack all the things. Drink all the booze, hack all the things. Drink all the booze, hack all the things. Got this black and this red, boy, they still give me wings. So we drink all the booze, hack all the things. Drink all the booze, hack all the things. Drink all the booze, hack all the things. Zero through three, we're in every single ring. I mean, these servers have more firewalls than the devil's bedroom. Hack all the things. Drink all the booze. Times are changing and consumers are getting a lot more privacy focused and here to talk about all of the nerdy details with that is Alan from Spider Oak. Alan, how are you? Great, glad to be here. Yeah, it's, it's third day of DEF CON, so if we sound a little froggy, that's why. Of course, yeah, it was 10 minutes to recover my voice this morning. Yeah, but glad to be here breathing the Vegas air and uh, with our, our fellow tech enthusiasts and respecting our techno lust. Right? And so, you know what's really interesting is we're living in the, I don't want to say post node world because it seems too buzzwordy, but I think it's appropriate, yeah, in that, like, for once, consumers have, like, a, at least an inkling of security. It's not just the hackers here at DEF CON. And, um, Anyway, I just kind of wanted to pick your brain as uh, you know, an entrepreneur that's running a company all based on providing secure and privacy-focused tools for consumers and kind of get an idea from you like, you know, what are the challenges with business models and what are the latest tools that you're developing and, and things of that nature. Um, so I'll just preface this question by saying that like, it's really interesting to see a kind of shift in power. Like similar to how it probably was hundreds of years ago from church to state uh, as now we have state to corporation in that like on the internet the currency of the internet is information and that is the power that's being held by corporations and now of course governments want that and so that's the kind of eye-opening experiences that we saw with with uh, Snowden what kind of reaction did you get from your consumers when all of that kind of came to light Wow, that's uh, what a great frame for several questions. First of all, post Snowden, I think, is a really apt description of the technology world in the last couple of years, because um, we've seen so many more like PhD thesis and grad students doing master's degrees in crypto and open source crypto projects and so on. I really think, uh, for better or worse, the U.S. government has done a tremendous amount to advance cybersecurity in the last year just by allowing the Snowden leaks to happen, because the response to it has been great for our industry. Right, you look at things like Signal, uh, the protocol, you know, formerly tech secure, being implemented in things like WhatsApp and even Facebook now. So, uh, I don't know, it seems like corporations are adopting crypto, our consumers. Yes, and there's, there's always been a segment of the marketplace that cared very enthusiastically, but now it's going mainstream. And I think there's two or three things that are promoting that. There's obviously the, the idea of ending mass surveillance and the, the chilling effects and the, the, you know, people just don't like having their conversations observed. But also, the tools are getting way better. Products like Signal revolutionized the UI and the user experience and, and made it enjoyable to use an end-to-end -end encrypted product. And we're starting to see, you know, business to business products coming out that really put user experience first. So uh, you're probably most known for your backup solution, Spider Oak. That's, you know, uh, where you can bring your own crypto. And I'm sure I'm very, very poorly summarizing it. But um, as a kind of a backup cloud sync solution for files after those new leaks, did you get a bunch of uh, like, you know, emails from consumers like concerned about their data and their privacy? Uh, we get the gamut of 
emails inbound from people from you know all levels of paranoia and technology interest and so on. And I think one of the reasons that the Spider Oak backup product has been successful is that there's no place that you have to go to manage keys. There's nothing that you have to do. Like all that happens for you. And so you know the user experience is very different than something like PGP. Oh, come on, man. Don't we all love, you know, drop it to the command prompt and running GPG, tack this, tack that, and signing our stuff and oh. uploading it to the MIT key server and then uh, doing it all wrong. Uh, anyway, wow, we really have come a long way. Yeah, and so I'm starting to think about this very philosophically. And, you know, if, we're, if we have this goal of ending corporate surveillance or government surveillance or so on, then the only way that works is if the products that are secure are also viral. And the, on, the only way a product is viral is if the people that you convince to use it also convince their friends to use it and so on. They have to be recommending it to others just because they want to demonstrate how good their own taste is. Right? I, I find that very interesting because it is, it's like, you know, Apple products, for instance, you know, like there's, a, there's a sexy factor to it, there's a status factor to it, and you, you kind of, maybe, you know, for better or worse, you need something like that, and, uh, you know, I'm just so thankful that Signal, as a, as a good example, is being adopted, because people may not even know that they're using that kind of, uh, you know, uh, secure communication. Um, when I think about secure communication and secure products, the ones that I really gravitate towards are the ones where there is no possible way to comply with the court order, technically, because you just don't have the keys. I think of a secure product as one where it is not vulnerable not to hackers and exploits. There will always be hackers and exploits, but not vulnerable to secret court orders where you just physically can't comply, sorry, my hands are tied, I don't have the crypto keys, F off, it's not mine to give you. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, if we're going to continue seeing that and what your thoughts are on that. So, of, of course, there's all that interest. And, you know, our goal in building Semaphore was to do, you know, for businesses and large group conversations, the same, same thing that Sim Signal did for individual conversations and, you know, small group conversations. But one of the things that we were most surprised by is of course corporations are worried about data leaks and all these other things and external threats like you know I don't want the hosting provider to have access to my data I don't want the government to have access to my data but actually the threat that they were most concerned about is internal management has never had a way to communicate securely that was free that was free from observation by their IT staff and IT staff have never had a way to communicate securely where their security was not vulnerable to compromise by other users of the organization. Like somebody in the organization can have bad practices which gets the email ser server compromised or something like that. IT needs a way, like a secure enclave, a socially secure enclave for different groups. And so one of the things that you know, we put into Semaphore just kind of by default is that every channel is end-to-end -end encrypted just to the participants of that channel and that turned out to be the thing that businesses were most excited about. Okay, so you brought up Semaphore. Uh, that's your new product at Spider Oak. Tell me a bit about it. What, what does it do for businesses? So Semaphore is an end-to-end -end encrypted alternative to Slack. And you know, the idea is that you know, Slack has this amazing user experience. It's super friendly. It gets everybody away from their email. It lets them contextualize projects and so on. And you know, for a company like us that you know, grew up on IRC for the last 10 years, we, we understand the benefit of simple, real-time, informal conversations. But we wanted a way to do that that's very convenient and is end-to-end -end secure. And so we built Semaphore to you know, solve that need. And it turns out there's a lot of other companies that are very excited about being able to adopt a technology like Slack that has the security as well. You know, I, I actually, I'm glad that you brought up IRC because everybody's like, oh, so Slack seems to be getting like so much buzz now. And I'm like, guys, you do realize this is IRC, essentially. IRC and and I, exactly. Bots and stuff like that. Yeah. And what, one of the first plugins that we built for Semaphore was just the IRC integration, so people can use like a local IRC client. Because there are kernel hackers out there that will just never let go of their IRC interface ever, right. and that's I, fine. That's awesome. I, I just I, it just makes me want to get on Undernet and hit exclamation point F serve or something, yeah. you know. <laughs> But there are some niceties to the modern approach, like push notifications and mobile interface and persistence and attachments that work when you're not online. And 
it's totally what you were just talking about. It's a social thing, right? And it's actually really interesting to see that something as underground as IRC is becoming a social phenomenon in mainstream society. Uh, and so what you're trying to do is take that same thing and then make it end-to-end -end secure. Tell me about how the security works. So Spider Oak has been building crypto products for a long time. And um, with this one, we were really excited about how the state of crypto software has evolved to the extent that we could use really just one or two well-proven, well-established libraries. You know, the things, the, the crypto involved in Semaphore comes from Scrypt and Libsodium. And um, that, that, you know, those libraries solve all of the challenges of, oh, which, ci which block cipher do you use in this case? Or which Mac algorithm do you use to authenticate messages? Like, all of that is already going to happen using best practices just by using these libraries. So we can focus, you know, mostly on not, not inventing cryptography, but building a product, you know, solving the UX and, and all those other things. Because, the, you know, the crypto communities really came together and produced these, these options for applied cryptographers like us to, you know, build a product with. Right. And the product is uh, a desktop app for, uh, and of course you have a mobile solution as well. Yeah, so one of the things that we did that's kind of controversial is, you know, there's no browser interface. There's no, there's no web interface, and, and that's because never in the history of the world has there been a secure browser. And, you know, br browsers have all of your you know, interaction with the rest of the internet in them. That's not a good place to do end-to-end -end encryption. So Semaphore ships as a standalone native application on every platform. The way God intended. <laughs> okay, I like that. Well, here, here's what I'm really curious about is uh, you, you're running this, uh, this business that's privacy focused and uh, building these applications for consumers. Um, I look at other, you know, giant ecosystems, be it the Googles and Facebooks of the world, where people put their information up there and those corporations have to monetize it somehow, uh, typically through advertising, which means that they by default, for some reason, see the content, even though it may be a message that I'm sharing with a small group of friends on Google+, Plus, if anyone still uses that, or Facebook, but there's not any technical reason why the platform should actually have the uh, even technical feasibility to read that message, and yet that's not the case, and therefore it is susceptible to the vulnerability of the government uh, national security letter. Uh, what are your thoughts on that in regards to operating a profitable business? Wow. Um, so one of the, the we get this question a lot, like why why doesn't everybody do end-to-end -end encryption? And uh, you know, even in business models where you don't necessarily need to monetize the data. I mean, obviously, you know, Facebook and Google and many other corporations rely on the economic feedback loop of of data monetization. But even for companies that don't. Well, it's a lot of extra effort. Like, it's, it's going to probably double or triple your dev cycle length, and you have to have specialized skills involved in the team, and then review and, you know, outside security auditing, which is expensive and hard to schedule. I mean, it's, it's a massive undertaking to build an application that has end-to-end -end encryption compared to building the same application in plain text. And there are many problem domains that it just doesn't work for at all. Like, wh where you need server-side big data analysis, it's not going to work. Uh, at, at least with the technology that we have today and, you know, the state of the art of, of those algorithms. We are, you know, a academia is moving the, the theory and some implementations for all those things forward. And I think in 20 years, we'll have a very different story. But most people today that just want to get a product done and make their customers happy, unless they have a really specific need, they're just going to build the thing that does what their customers are directly asking for. I mean, I, I think of... Why don't people apply cryptography? It's the same answer of like, well, why don't people, you know, do really good software security? You know, why, why are people still finding routine SQL injections? You know, it's, it's all the same stuff. So when it comes to the software security, what kind of design decisions do you make to keep your product uh, from being vulnerable to the secret court order attack surface? Oh, wow. Um, so there's a few things. Obviously, the best thing is to not have much data. Um, and issue a transparency report as often as possible and give as much information as you can. Um, but otherwise, there are some places where it's, it's really important that the customer can actually run an on-premises version of the product themselves. And th the reason is so that the court has to come to them and they, they can't come to you know, a third party provider and you know, the, the customer just has no idea that there's been a request for their information. And so you know, our, our, we don't have the on-premises support yet, but it's coming very soon. Wow, that's that's exciting because a, lo a lot of other you know a lot of um, like VPN service providers is a great example. They're like, oh, we don't keep logs. It's like, 
cool, bro. Um, one last thought on this uh, bef uh, before we wrap up. I really want to know what your thoughts are on canaries. Oh, uh, well, we run one. Um, it's, it's a surprising amount of effort to you know, o organize a group of people that are preferably in different countries and continents and so on to, to you know, keep up with the canary all the time. And the EFF has actually changed their recommendations about canaries. You know, they were doing this project about Canary Watch and all that stuff, but now the recommendation is just have a transparency report that you issue you know, quarterly or, or however often you can. Um, because there's been so many like false alarms with canaries where just some step of the you know necessary sequence of events didn't happen and and people were worried about it and then you know the canary is kind of the binary signal you know it says all things are good or it says nothing and you're, you're left to speculate and as, as a business owner you really don't want to be in that situation where your your customers are just left to speculate because we can we, yeah. all sorts of terrible things happening we don't want another true crypt and we definitely don't want another lava bit. Uh, so I guess we'll just wrap up by saying I, I'm really thankful that w for what you're doing for the community. Uh, I'm you know, in awe of somebody that's running a business and, and making it doing this kind of stuff. And, um, and I think everybody should go and just check out the product because somebody that cares this much about it uh, you know, falls within, uh, that's in our heart. So uh, where can people find out more about the product? And of course, Spiderook. At spiderook.com and then slash semaphore. So, yeah, great to be here, and uh, likewise about Hack5's effort to build a community over the last 11 years. It's pretty awesome. The funny thing is, it was all born on IRC, so it all comes full circle. All right, <laughs> all right cool. Thank you. When you've got that great idea, do what Shannon and I do and take it to the internet using domain.com. They have a fantastic domain exploration tool that'll help you find the perfect domain name just for you. And their checkout process is super simple, which means your website will be up and online in no time flat. And get this, the guys over at domain.com are huge fans of Hack5, so they wanna hook you up with an extra 20% off. And all you have to do is use the coupon code HAK5, that spells Hack5. And you know what? You can even tweet them at domain.com and say, hey, thanks guys for supporting Hack5 all these years. So when you think domain names, think domain.com. Hey everybody, I am back again here at DEFCON 24 with Mark Newland from Bastille. So I actually did a segment on ThreatWire about something else that you were into, Key Sniffer. So if you guys watched that segment, this is the guy behind that tool. But you are here talking about something different, about Mouse Jacker, correct? Uh, that's correct. So I actually gave a talk today about both Mouse Jack and Key Sniffer covering all these vulnerabilities. And so it was a total of 16 keystroke sniffing and ejection vulnerabilities affecting devices from 16 different vendors that I've discovered over the last uh, six or eight months or so. That's really bad that there's so many vulnerabilities out there. So what is the difference between key sniffer and mouse jack? And there's a lot of overlap. So in the case of mouse jack, it was primarily doing keystroke injection targeting wireless mice. Key sniffer is primarily keystroke sniffing on unencrypted keyboards, but there are some devices that fall in both categories and some additional encrypted keystroke injection vulnerabilities, which we haven't publicized, but I discussed today at the talk. So can you tell me a little bit about how you decided to look into this kind of thing? Yeah, so it, it kind of started with a Burning Man project. So I was, I was building this big LED cover top hat for Burning Man, and I built a wireless NES controller to talk to my Burning Man hat. I used the same type of transceiver in the NES controller as Logitech uses in their mice. So for DEF CON last year, I set it up so I could actually control other people's mice, and the IoT Village had this wireless uh, Logitech mouse for their presentation clicker. So I was messing with them all day, and they had no idea exactly what was happening, so they left a post-it note reading, don't fuck with me, next to their laptop and you know I, I figured at that point it was too much I did not want to stress them out and confess that I was the one doing this and you know it was it was an adventure okay so tell me a little bit about um, what these vulnerabilities are and how they work yeah so on a high level you have a lot of proprietary protocols where the vendors have implemented their own security schemes and use these different transceivers to you know do this communication in a way that's non-standardized and they've all messed it up in different ways and it's possible to both inject keystrokes directly into USB dongles, sniff keystrokes from these keyboards. And there's actually a fun vulnerability with this Logitech gaming mouse where you can maliciously and wirelessly program a keystroke macro into the mouse. Then the next time somebody using the mouse clicks a button on that mouse, it will execute that keystroke macro on their computer. Really? That's, oh my god, that's so messed up, but that's amazing that you found that vulnerability. <laughs> it's, it, it's been fun stuff, and what really gets me is that none of these skills are too esoteric. I'm sure other people can do this and maybe have done this and not disclosed it. It's tough to say. You just happen to be the guy who was like, oh, I wonder if this works. I'm going to try it. <laughs> I, it turns out I'm kind of relentless, and I do not drop a project <laughs> until I'm done, and I, my girlfriend confessed that I spent, you know, 
too many hours working on this, but the results were good. So this will work on like Logitech's proprietary devices, not Bluetooth though, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so it's non-Bluetooth and it covers you know, Logitech, Dell, Lenovo, Microsoft, Amazon, Gigabyte, Radio Shack, Insignia, Kensington, Schmaus, uh, GE, Jasco, Radio Shack, uh, Toshiba, uh, a, a lot of vendors. All right, you, you don't have to name them all off. It sounds like pretty much all the vendors out there, yeah. but... <laughs> more or less. Yeah, more or less, right, right, more or less. So I'm... I'm actually a little bit curious about have you disclosed this to these vendors and have they put a fix into place? So we had two rounds of disclosure. We disclosed the mouse jack round in November and the key sniffer round and associated vulnerabilities um, in April. Um, Logitech can update the firmware on their mice. Most of the other vendors have no ability to update the devices. So Logitech has released this dongle firmware update that addresses some of the problems. All of the other vendors are still vulnerable. You know, the least they could do is just like replace them with something that's not vulnerable. And so, uh, kindly, Anchor has offered to replace their vulnerable keyboards for Bluetooth keyboards uh, through the end of August. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific replacement plans with the other vendors, but I'm sure they you know, might be able to do that in some cases. So I feel like you're not going to post the code online because this is a pretty heavy vulnerability, but are you posting any kind of information from your talk online? So we've released open source firmware that you can actually flash onto Logitech dongles and use this to do generic transmission and reception of packets. But then I released a white paper with my talk data that has full details on the protocols and packet formats for these kind of attacks. Awesome. And we will put the link to the show notes in that. I believe it's on GitHub, correct? Uh, that's correct. So the code is on GitHub, and then the white paper will be on GitHub today or tomorrow. Sweet. Yeah, you heard it here first. We'll, we'll put it down in the show notes for you so everybody can check it out. And I would love to see some of you guys start implementing some interesting things, wouldn't you, sir? Uh, it, it definitely some smart people will look at this and put together some very neat code, I think. Most likely, most likely. Well, Mark, where can people find out more about you yourself? Uh, so I'm on Twitter at, at Mark Newland, my first name and last name. I have a blog, markdoolan.me. I blog once a year or so, so it's not very active. That's about how much I blog, too. I'm more of a podcaster. I don't know. It's my thing. So for more from DEF CON 24, you can check out uh, hack5.org, youtube.com slash hack5. You probably know the place since you're here already. Mark, thank you so much. I'm going to go drink some more drink and hack all the things. Well, that just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack 5. But before we get going, I want to let you guys know that if you are keen on coming out to the next con and having an awesome beer with us, you can find all the details. If we're doing a meetup over at hak5.org, we're going to be going to DerbyCon. Yingling! We're going to go to DerbyCon in Louisville, Kentucky, where they happen to serve Yingling. <laughs> so excited. And if you'd like to buy Shannon a Yingling, Come join us there. Closed, closed beverage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my rule. Go to conventions, close beverage every time. Or I order it right from the bartender. You can just give me the roofies. So <laughs> with that, uh, I am very excited to get uh, let you guys know that HAK5.org is the home to all of our podcasts, including Metasploit Minute and Threatwire and Tech Thing. And so find out all about those shows over at Hack5.org. It's also where you can find the links to all our social networks if you want to get in on the tweeting at us and such. And if you're into tweeting, tweet at Hack5 with the, uh, with the hashtag pound technolust. Pound, pound, pound technolust. technolust. Hashtag pound technolust because <laughs> I know how to internet. No, hashtag technolust. <laughs> yes. Darren's from the old school days of when we used to say pound. <laughs> I, I'm from the old school days where that meant something on a telephone keypad. Yes, it did. <laughs> I'm from dial tone. Do you remember dial tone? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to stop. Anyway, we're giving away awesome stuff from our hack shop. So tweet at us and win some Wi-Fi pineapples and some USB rubber duckies and some land turtles. Uh, and we'll feature those winners on the next show as we kick off season 21. Yay! And if you want to grab some of those goodies of yourselves right now, you can support us directly, hakshop.com. I also wanted to announce something else that is awesome that happened while we were at DEF CON yes. on our YouTube channel. So if you guys are watching this on RSS, uh, you can go over to youtube.com slash hack5 and you can subscribe there too because sometimes we'll put little tidbits there that don't belong on the RSS. Uh, we just hit 250,000 subscribers, oh. which is huge. It That's only took amazing. Us 11 years to get a quarter million subscribers. <laughs> That's natural growth. That's, it That's was, good yeah, stuff. totally that is natural like, growth. It's like, you know, it's like slow cooked, right? It's like free range, <laughs> fair trade. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm, All natural, organic, mm. act five. Are you hungry? Coming to you. Is yeah, it lunchtime? It is. Okay. <laughs> we got to go. Anyway, we will see you guys next week. Uh, and as we wrap up, 
awesome, awesome stickers this week. Thank you so much for the Cacodemon Vis. This is going up there. Yes. So many good ones. Uh, you can find details on Hello. how to send us stickers and links below, and we will see you next week. Until then, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. Trust your Technolust. <laughs> You know, so our first goal with Semaphore was, well, actually to make, give those corporations a secure option. Because right now they don't have one. Um, and uh, I, there's a lot of research on the side of, you know, when, when people know they're being observed, the efficiency of the team goes down because people can't, you know, communicate the things that people really need to communicate to get their job done. And there's, there's not as much research on this other side, but there's some, and it kind of makes sense that when, when people can communicate securely and freely and can have the little side conversations and off the record conversations, that teams are more efficient and more effective. So we think of this as like enabling a more efficient business. You know, it's kind of the same message as an alternative to email that will make you more efficient, but also just that you can say what you need to say. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely things that I, you know, wouldn't text. I, I don't use SMS here at the con, but like, of course we're using Signal, and it's like, well, yeah, I wouldn't have sent that as a text. Yeah. yeah. And there's things that I, I won't. I'll just have that conversation in person. Yeah. And. But yes, I, I think I, I like the idea too of like rolling your own, putting it in your own infrastructure uh, as a hosted solution. Because then you know you don't have that question of like, are they storing logs? You're like, no, we're gonna set the log rotation to one hour. Screw it. Yeah, exactly. And we always ran our own infrastructure because of the backup industry, um, and so it was a natural fit for Semaphore as well. And uh, that's how we're able to also offer an on-premises solution because we we don't rely on Amazon or any of those things. Oh man, I could pick your brain all day. This has been a lot of fun. Likewise. Yeah.